Welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar on spotted wing Drosophila, Lessons from the Last Decade for Management. We're going to go ahead and get started. And I want to highlight that this is a, pro um, a project output associated with the Sustainable Spotted Wing Drosophila Management Project supported by the USDA NEFA Specialty Crop Research Initiative. This webinar will last about an hour, followed by questions from the group. We'll be posting a recording of today's webinar at our project website, SWD Management, next week. We don't have pesticide credits available for this session if that is something you're interested in. However, if you live in a state where you can file requests on your own afterwards, you can contact me, Hannah Barak, at the email listed here for documentation of your attendance. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type your chest questions into the Q&A or into the chat box, and the moderator will collate and ask these questions at the end of the session. After the webinar, you can direct any questions to myself, again, at the email listed on the slide here. The presenters for today's session include collaborators from our large sustainable spotted wing drosophila management project, myself, Hannah Barak, based at North Carolina State University, Greg Loeb from Cornell, Joanna Chu from UC Davis, Vaughn Walton from Oregon State University, Phil Fanning from the University of Maine, Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State University, Kent Dana from UC Berkeley, Ash Sayal from the University of Georgia, Cesar Rodriguez Sona from Rutgers University, and Miguel Gomez, also at Cornell University. Our outline for today is ambitious. So our goal is to cover the progress that we collectively have made on understanding the biology and management of spotted wind drosophila over the last roughly 10 years since its introduction and global range expansion. To do this, we're going to be talking about several subject areas. First, invasion biology, the seasonal biology of SWD, and how its population genetics might inform our management methods and tactics. Next, we'll discuss host range and preference, followed by pesticide efficacy and non-target effects of those pesticide management tools. Finally, biological control, cultural and post-harvest controls, monitoring and applications for behavioral control, and finally, putting the pieces together to help use all of this information to make better management decisions. As I said, this is an output of a large nationally representative research collaboration that is led by Ash Sayal based at University of Georgia in collaboration between many of the presenters in this session, as well as others from around the United States. This project will be continuing for the next four years to further our understanding of spotted wing drosophila biology and management. The goals of this project are broadly to assemble teams of growers to implement our best management practices for spotted wing drosophila and to really serve as a test lab for those management practices, to develop decision aids for farmers to increase profitability, implement sustainable alternatives to insecticide usage, to reduce the risk of insecticide resistance, and then to disseminate this information to enable producers to optimize their pest management decisions. And that's what we're going to do today. You'll also find more information about our project at our project website, swdmanagement.org. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Loeb, who's going to cover our first topic invasion biology, seasonal biology, and population genetics. And Greg, just let me know when you're ready for me to advance slides. Good, thanks, Hannah. I'm gonna make this a pretty fast summary of some of the work we've been doing on trying to understand the factors that drive population dynamics as spotted wing and risk, and therefore helpfully lead to better pest management. Um, the three sort of subtopics I'm gonna talk about is the effects of low and high temperature uh, Tolerances on spotted wing survival, survival, and that's implications for seasonal or seasonal biology. And I want to talk about some the work and the outcomes of population modeling that we've been doing as a team, um, and what it, what, how it can be used to, to improve pest management decision making. I'll give you a specific example, 
And finally, I want to talk about some of the uh, work that, that we've been doing on the population genetics and the variation in genetics in spotted wing populations and what that has to say about how spotted wing moves and that has implications for pest management as well. Now, you can learn more about a lot of these topics with our previous last webinar associated with this team and you can see the, the, the link there at the bottom of the first slide and, and Hannah referred to it earlier. Next slide, please. So the pattern of population dynamics kind of describes the seasonality and also determines when you as growers are at risk for spotted wing Drosophila infestation. Spotted wing Drosophila is a temperate species of a vinegar fly. It's kind of constrained in the north by the cold temperatures, winter temperatures in the Arctic and, down, and, and constrained from the so in the south from probably high temperatures and maybe other factors. Within the temperate zone of the United States, we also see variation in the seasonality of spotted wing. In the area where I live, in the north temperate area, we typically see a large peak at the end of the field season. Um, and then during the winter, we virtually can't find the flies. If you go a little bit south, a little more temperate climate, uh, you can find flies all year round, but they still see this large peak as you go into the, the field season where it peaks later in the season. Finally, on the west coast in California and the Mediterranean climate where we know it's very hot and dry in the summer, we often see a decline in population in the middle of the summer that's kind of spaced by higher peaks in the spring and the fall. All right, so what are the factors that drive this seasonality? Next slide, please. We've done a lot of work on temperature tolerances, both low temperatures in the winter and high temperatures in the summer. And on the bottom here, I just summarized some of the take home messages. One, we found that spotted wing softly goes into a, a diapause, which is a way for them to ch change morphologically and physiologically to help them survive cold temperatures. And they get a lot of that, in, especially in northern parts of the United States. Um, we also found that cool temperatures late in the fall uh, when they're developing that kind of a late, late term in fruit lead to winter morph type flies, which have a characteristic morphology and physiology that again helps them survive the winter. And you can see the little diagram of the flies upper, the one on the right is a winter morph fly. They are more tolerating of low temperature and the graph on the left shows how winter morph flies in orange and summer morph flies in blue respond to declining temperatures. And you can see even at minus seven, degrees Celsius, 50% of the winter morph flies are surviving. That's about, I don't know, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, whereas all the summer morph flies have died. But we do know that when, even winter morph flies are sensitive to cold and extended cold time periods. And the graph on the right is field data that we've collected over several years that shows that the more days below zero or freezing re really reduces survivorship. And that kind of actually has led to some really interesting re results where we see a correlation between how cold and severe the winters are, this is especially in northern parts of their distribution, and risk the next season. And we think we can use that to help growers anticipate future problems. Now in the summertime, um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we know these flies really don't like really hot temperatures. And when they get above 90 degrees or so, they kind of go into a summer quiescence that they will recover to them. That that's kind of explains that depression in populations. Next slide, please. Let me um, move on to a really nice set of work that Devon Walton's group has been doing in Oregon that other people have also been helping him test. He's developed a population model and several models to, to explain the population growth of spotted wing Drosophila, and then has used that to test management option. And in this case, he's testing you know, what's the best timing for using your most efficacious versus your least efficacious materials? The first slide is model generated uh, populations of the different life stages of spotted wing over the season when there's no intervention. The next one uh, shows what happens if you go with your kind of least effective material early when the populations are low and then save your best stuff for late. And you see some suppression, but it's not that great. Um, and I would argue that a lot of us have kind of recommended this pattern in the past save your best for last. Now, when Vaughn modeled the alternative option with doing with your best material first, next slide, actually showed in the model the best reduction in populations. They have now taken that model prediction and they can say, okay, let's test this under field. Next slide shows some results. Uh, next one, sorry, Hannah. Shows some results, I think this is out of Oregon that Vaughn did, that does indicate that if you go with your best material first, the blue line, you get a little bit better reduction infestation than when you go with your 
least effective material first in the orange line. Next slide, please. So these are just sort of the outputs of that model and that bottom one is really the one we really wanna to continue to pursue because that may change how growers approach their uh, rotation of materials. Uh, next slide. Finally, I wanted to summarize some of the work that Joanna Chu at UC Davis has been leading from our team. She's looked at the genetic variation in different spotted wing crawfish populations throughout the United States. And next slide, please, also in Europe and Asia. Um, and asked how they compare. Next slide, please. She's done various types of analyses that are kind of shown and summarized in these principal component graphs on the top. But the basic take home messages are, one, the spotted wing in the United States is sort of distinct from um, Europe and Asia. It's kind of interesting. In the United States, we see distinction between Eastern and Western United States and not a lot of exchange. But in the Eastern United States, there seems to be evidence of movement, longer distance movements of the genes and therefore flies from the southern part of the, uh, the United States into the northern part. And this has real implications for how things like uh, resistance might move around among populations, at least on the eastern part of the United States. Um, OK, I'm going to end it there. But I want to remind you, check out the full seminar to get a uh, webinar from last year to get sort of a more depth, uh, now, uh, depth review of this kind of information. All right, thank you, Greg. So I'm spearheading the next section in which we'll discuss host range and preference. And first, I want to highlight that spotted wing, uh, spotted wing Drosophila host susceptibility is fairly well understood for crop hosts. I'm highlighting the bottom here from a study that was conducted by Dave Bellamy and others, um, indicating the relative preference of some of the main crop hosts um, initially that we were concerned about with spotted wing drosophila, highlighting that through a series of different experiments, raspberry was the most preferred, followed by strawberries, blackberry, cherry, peach, blueberry, and finally grape. And this is consistent with what we've seen in laboratory studies, indicating that rosaceae or caneberries and strawberries are among the most preferred hosts. We know that when flies are given a choice, they prefer to lay eggs in raspberries over other hosts. And that in addition to preferring raspberries, they often seem to perform better in those hosts than in others. We also know that seasonality has a significant role in crop risk. And this is just an illustration that I use based on work that we've done trapping in North Carolina and then overlaying the crop harvest periods on top of some generalized trapping data. While we can catch flies during the entire year here in North Carolina, our populations remain pretty low until midsummer. And therefore crops that ripen and are harvested during these periods of the year, strawberries, for example, in spring, and some blueberry varieties that are harvested in the early part of summer, escape some of the larger population pressures that we experience later in the year when for us caneberries are primarily harvested. Now this phenology is going to shift depending on where you are in the country and what crops you are growing. So blueberries may be a fall crop in other parts of the countries such as the Pacific Northwest or the upper Midwest and in that case they're going to fall into a higher risk period. So seasonality really depend, really influences the susceptibility of flies. But this fly trap capture pattern, where we see large peaks increasing very rapidly following midsummer, is conserved throughout the country. So we see relatively low populations, in some cases in cooler parts of the country, undetectable populations in the first half of the growing season, followed by a very rapid population growth in the second half of the year. We also know that fruit becomes susceptible to infestation when they first ripen, but the risk to underripe fruit can be decreased by decreasing populations. This is work that was done by a graduate student in my lab, Katie Swoboda Baderai, where she looked at exposing fruit of different ripeness stages on the plant to ambient populations of flies. And what she observed was that we, when, we, when we had high populations in an unmanaged, unpicked research planting, infestation began as soon as that fruit started to change color when it was green pink. It was highest in perfectly ripe fruit, but that infestation potential occurred as soon as the fruit started to change color. However, when she repeated this work in a commercial field the following year where the 
Flies were actively managed through insecticide applications and fruit were harvested on a roughly three day schedule. There were low numbers of flies in the entire planting and that resulted in infestation being concentrated in their preferred ripeness stage, ripe fruit rather than these ripening fruit. And what we think is happening there is under ideal situation, the flies would prefer to lay their eggs in ripe fruit. So when there are low numbers of flies, their infestation is concentrated there. As population density increases, however, we see spillover from that ripe fruit to less preferred unripe stages hierarchically. We also have learned that non-crop host range for spotted wing drosophila is extremely broad. This was work done in Europe and I really like this figure because it illustrates throughout the 12 month period of the year that spotted wing drosophila was detected in at least one non-crop host species. So the take home message here is that in most environments, there is potential substrate for these flies to develop on year round, as long as the climatic conditions, the weather are conducive to their activity. In addition, work done by Dara Stockton in Greg's lab up at Cornell has highlighted that flies will feed on many different substrates, not just fruit. And this includes things like mushrooms, flowers, and both mammal and bird manure. And so you can get eggs being laid and spotted wing drosophila being reared out from all of these different substrates. They can also be found in compost piles or other decomposing substrates during the winter. And this is observations from Michigan during 2016 at 15 different locations that pumice piles and compost were also a potential source of spotted wing drosophila presence. But all these non-crop hosts are not necessarily created equal. And so while spotted wing drosophila can readily attack lots of different possible substrates, their offspring, their larvae do not do well across all of those different diets. And so fruit and mushrooms resulted in larger, healthier flies as compared to something like manure. But the take home message here is there is something that these flies can eke their way through on most of the year when they are available, when the weather conditions allow them to become active. And so fruit is not the only substrate required for reproduction and survival. There's lots of other potential things that they can feed on as well. And this of course is going to change over time. And if we can understand where this host use pattern shift occurs, we can more potentially, we can potentially target these flies when they are most vulnerable to management and their population sizes are the smallest. And so this is work that we're continuing in other aspects of this project. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Phil Fanning, who's going to address pesticide efficacy and non-target effects. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about pesticide efficacy. So if you flick onto the next slide there. So when we think about pesticide efficacy, really we want to use our best uh, products, uh, like uh, was pointed out with Vaughan's model. We really want to use good products early on, uh, but generally we want to choose very efficacious products. Uh, so the slide you're seeing here is a kind of a breakdown or a survey that we've done of crop consultants, researchers, and industry folks uh, across nine different states and 19 different state crop combinations, uh, where we asked them to rank different insecticides basically on their efficacy for spotting Drosophila based on uh, their experiences with the, the crop. Uh, for the most part, we still recommend that, you know, in high pressure situations, we make applications of insecticides at tight intervals, you know, maybe seven, every seven days when pressure, uh, SWD pressure is really high, make reapplications after rain and choose effective insecticides. So if you look at this list, we're going to make basically work from uh, left to right here. You can see there's obviously some that we wouldn't recommend for spotted wing drosophila uh, as a sole application. And there's others that rank pretty high, uh, above good and nearly excellent. So you can see the first ones, the neonicotinoids, they obviously ranked pretty low in this survey. Um, Admire and Assail, which are two um, neonicotinoids, they ranked low. The next product, Cormoran, is actually a mix of Assail, which is a Cenomephrid, and Ryman, which is Nuvoloron. So 
this cormoran product is a mix of both of them, and that ranked probably the highest of this first group that I'm highlighting here, to, which is neonicotinoids and premixes. I apologize for the international folks. These are all trade names associated with um, US, um, US products. Uh, the next group is the pyrethroids. These all have a PRY in the parentheses after the product name. And they all score uh, good to excellent um, first bottling Drosophila control. So this has been an important chemical class for us to in controlling spotting Drosophila. Spinosins, which is delegate and radiant, they also uh, rank good to excellent uh, in, in the listings here. The next lanate, which is a carbamate, uh, is also an important insecticide. And then you have the organophosphates, all of which, with the exception of seven, also rank pretty high. Finally, we're going to finish with the diamides. Uh, there's a new product here, Vertiprin, that uh, works really well for spotting Drosophila control. And we've seen some re really good efficacy in our field trials. And then you have XRL, which has been on the market for a while. The last two is don't really score as very well. Sphere, which is a biological product, has been uh, tested quite a lot and does pretty well. So on the next slide, we're going to look at organic uh, materials. And uh, these organic materials are all OMRI listed. As you can see, we ran this survey with all of these products. So you're going to see that the levels are a lot lower here when it comes to uh, the rankings. Uh, and Trust, which is probably our best product for uh, spot of Drosophila control in organic settings, still only rates, you know, around good. It doesn't meet that good to excellent ranking like a lot of the other insecticides. Obviously, uh, Entrust does have some um, label restrictions that are really important when it comes to spot of Drosophila control. So there's seasonal limits. You're restricted to five to six applications per season, but there's also built-in requirements to rotate uh, with other insecticides for resistance management. And obviously, insecticide resistance within trust is something we're always very concerned about. So looking at these products, you have a lot of neem-based products. There's azadirectin and azagard. Azira is a mixture of neem and pyrethrins. Then you have our Entrust, which is a really important one. And then some biologicals. Uh, Grandivo is a biological. Pyganicus pyrethrins. The other two, Jetag and Oxidate, these are perioxacetic acid products. And I'm going to talk a little bit about them later. And then we have Veritran D. Veritran D, it's important to note, it is OMRI listed. But we're still waiting for a label on a lot of fruit and crops, but we've, we've tested that quite a lot. So on the next slide, we're going to look at this all in a different, different light. So what I've taken here is I've taken all of the rankings from the six um, chemical classes, the carbamates, diamides, neonicotinoids, organophosphates, and pyrethroids, and spinosins. And we're just highlighting the top one here. So obviously, when we're doing our insecticide applications, we're always, always advising to rotate our chemical classes for resistance management. So I'm not going to go through all this list, but you can see here if you were choosing a spray program based on you know, the top ranked efficacy in terms of these products, you would choose uh, the collection of these and rotate them for your insecticide class or for your insecticide uh, program for the season. You can see here in the bottom organic uh, options. Again, you're kind of limited to entrust across all of these crops. All right, I'll move on quickly to the next slide where we're going to talk a little bit about some of our work on uh, feeding stimulants. So uh, you can see here on the uh, diagram on the right hand side, you can see a little fly. So there's been some really interesting work done that shows that when flies like spot and Drosophila land on a surface, Basically, they have sensors within their feet uh, that can basically taste what they land on. And this is really interesting. And it, we thought it might be a really good way of getting uh, spotting Drosophila to uptake more insecticides. So we tested uh, sweeteners, but we also tested yeasts. And yeast play a really important role in spotting Drosophila's development. Uh, when we rear it in the lab, we use uh, yeast in all of our diets. It impacts larval development and survival. It impacts, uh, we obviously use it as an attractant, and it also helps in adult fecundity. So yeasts are really important. So we tested yeast and we tested sweetened surfaces in terms of sugar in the field. So on the next slide, we'll be able to look at some of our bioassay data from the lab. So just to walk you through the slides here, on all of these um, graphs that you see here, 
you will see proportion mortality on the y-axis on the left. And then across the bottom is the concentration of the active ingredient of the four insecticides we tested. So we had a neonicotinoid, acetamephrid, um, malathion, and then on the bottom, we had two spinosins, uh, delegate and entrust. And these were all products that we were very interested to see if we could improve their efficacy by adding in uh, these feeding stimulants, sugar and yeast. Um, if you go from the top right uh, or top left across, you can see really a set of effort benefited probably the most from sugar. Uh, in the dark line, uh, you will see the active ingredient only. And then you have the fine dotted line that is the active ingredient plus sugar. And then the other uh, line, which is a dot and uh, a longer line is uh, the active ingredient plus yeast. The real big take home here is uh, the feeding stimulants did work pretty well in lab bioassays. Uh, acetamephrid with yeast was probably the one we saw the greatest success in. Uh, malathion as well showed some product. Um, interestingly, in the spinosins, we didn't see a, a big effect, but we did notice that when we added yeast in with spinosins, it actually negatively impacted uh, their, their efficacy. Looking at some field uh, data in the next slide, this is some trials we've done in uh, Northern Highbush Blueberry in Michigan. Uh, and the different color bars on this graph are, are different days after treatment. So they're different residue ages in the, in the field. And on the bottom axis, we can see there are products. We had spinetoram, which is delegate again. Uh, we had spinetoram and sugar, spinetoram and yeast, spinetoram, sugar and yeast. And then what we did is we'd spray these in the field, we'd bring them back into the lab and put them into a little bioassay container, which is the top picture on the left. And we'd introduce Spotwing Drosophila and basically assess their mortality. One thing you'll notice is for the most part, there was a lot of variation uh, within our data, but looking across the treatments within the different colors, uh, we can see that we really didn't see in the field a strong effect of these phagostimulants or feeding stimulants on at least uh, spinetoram or delegates efficacy in the field. So we're testing some other products. Um, as I said, a set of method looked really good in the lab, but it didn't, didn't really translate, or we didn't, in, at least in delegate, it didn't translate into the field. So the next products, our next slides we're gonna look at is the uh, crop sanitizers. So we were testing crop sanitizers because as I said, we know that yeast is really important for spotwing drosophila uh, in terms of their development, their attractitude and their survival. So in the field, we wanted to look at these crop sanitizers to see how they would impact uh, control of spotwing drosophila. So there's a number of different products. Uh, you have Jedag and Oxidase, Sporquil. I haven't trust on here mostly because we are looking at these a lot because we're looking for rotational partners for entrust. In a lot of incidents, instances, these um, perioxic acetic products are uh, OMRI approved. Um, so they might have really good uh, efficacy in terms of a rotation within trust. So we've done some trials in the field. I will say that the data I'm going to show next is purely associated with uh, conventional products. Um, and when we tested these, we re did really did high FR, high water rates in the field, because we think coverage is really important when it comes to these crop sanitizers efficacy. On the next slide, or on this slide, you'll see basically that um, this is a, a lab bioassay that was run by Kelly Hamby in Maryland, where we looked at plated yeasts uh, within um, these Petri dishes, and we introduced in the perioxic acetic products into the um, Petri dishes. You can see here on the top left is the control uh, with no, if, it, no impact. And then as we move from move to the right, we had a half dose of, in this case, it was JEDAG we were using, where we did see an effect on the yeast. You'll see that halo around that middle piece. And then as we moved up the doses, we saw we greater, we had a greater impact on the yeast. So in the field, if we move on to the next slide, you'll see basically how we tested this in a rotation. Uh, there's a few different treatments here. So I'm gonna walk through it. The green is an untreated. This is where we treated no bushes. Uh, the next um, treatment was a rotation of Mustang Max, Lanate and Imidan, so a pyrethroid, a carbamate, and a, um, an organophosphate. Then we had a pyrethroid followed by two uh, applications of 
this jet ag or this perioxygenic acid product. And then we had just a straight weekly treatment of um, jet ag. So these were all done weekly uh, as you see them here in the list. What you'll see for the first three dates, uh, we didn't really see much difference between our treatments. And then our spotting Drosophila numbers really crept up. And you can see our untreated control in green on that August 14th date was really quite high. But when we look at the other treatments, we can see that our conventional rotation uh, worked really well. But we also had really good efficacy from our pyrethroid and perioxic acetic acid treatment or uh, spray program. And then our perioxic acid acetic alone product uh, or rotation worked also pretty similar. So these were really some encouraging results. And we're really trying to delve into this more and some more trials coming up soon. I think now I'll pass you over to Rufus, who's going to talk a little bit. Hey, thank you very much. So I've got a few slides to talk about natural enemies. Um, Phil just talked about the direct effects on the pest, but as we develop our IPM programs, we really need to be thinking about side effects on these beneficial insects that are in our crop systems. So um, the data I'm going to share here are from a trial that we did a few years ago now, study we did a couple of years with uh, colleagues in New Jersey. And we looked at this parasitoid, this predatory bug, and this lady beetle, and their susceptibility to different insecticides. You can see the methods there, and I won't go through the full details. You can look at the paper if you're interested, or just come back to this slide in the recording. Next, please. Thank you. So this shows um, data for fresh residues, at the zero day after treatment, and then those 14 days later. And the data on the on the left, you can see is percent mortality. So we've got the direct effect of the insects being dead, and then um, some that were knocked down, but they may have recovered, but they certainly weren't able to parasitize or attack any insects. So this is for the parasitic wasp, and you can see a range of different effects there with most of the products that are used against spotted wing drosophila being quite lethal to these wasps. Next. A slightly different effect on these pirate bugs. These were a little bit more um, tolerant of some of the insecticides. If you compare the two slides later in the recording, you can see that. But again, the broad spectrum insecticides are knocking out these um, beneficial insects. Next, please. And then the third group was the ladybugs. Um, these may not have a direct effect on spotted wind drosophila, but there's other beetles that might be predating on uh, pupae of this pest down on the, the floor of a crop field. So I think it's relevant to look at these data. And you can see a few of the products that um, were quite toxic at the beginning may have um, lo lost that toxicity over, over time. So um, also interesting here to think about how the options used for spotting wing drosophila might also be influencing this and the other natural enemies that we just showed. Next, please. Um, we just heard about organic insecticides, and uh, I think it's important that we recognize that the main tool for spotted wing drosophila in organic production, which is in trust, is also quite toxic on, on natural enemies. Uh, this trial was done on um, a parasitic wasp that is not specific against spotted wing drosophila, but we would expect a similar result against the insects that we're hearing about, I think, in the next session of this webinar. So there are choices that organic growers can make on uh, balancing this toxicity against the key pest versus the risk of knocking out um, these beneficial insects that we're so interested in getting into our crop systems. Okay, next, please. And just to wrap this section up, um, we are starting to see in many of our crop systems around the country where spotted wing drosophila is being managed that there are some increases in secondary pests. Some photographs here show um, scale insects um, on, on crops. And I think this, this is something just to be highlighting to growers that might be on the call that although you may be successfully managing spotted wing drosophila, we need to keep our eyes open and scout our fields for scale insects, mites, aphids, other kinds of insects that may be um, increased by the natural enemies being, uh, being knocked out by these pesticides.
All right, thank you, Rufus and Phil. Now we're going to transition to discuss some of those biological control agents and Kent Dana will be taking over for this section of the presentation. Thank you, Hannah. So next, first slide. So I'm gonna focus really on a classic biocontrol program that we're working on. Although we are working with some of the native natural enemies as well. And this has been supported by the SCRI grant, but we're also doing this in coordination with a large international group, especially folks based in Europe and working with CAVI. Next. So the first thing we do in a classic biocontrol project is to determine if there are natural enemies present here to give us support. We've got going from left to right, this pupil parasitoid pachygropoides, another pupil parasitoid trichopria, and then different larval parasitoids. And what we found in most of the North American surveys prior to 2019, the pupil parasitoids are present, but they don't really give us control. Typically, it's below 10% parasitism. We are working with mass releases where we rear these in insectary and release these in hoop houses. And we are getting a little bit of an impact of that, but nothing that looks like it's going to be economical. What's important to note is that we have very few larval parasitoids in North America. They're either not present or if they do attack, spotted wing, it's almost a, a rare occurrence. Next. This is because spotted wing has got this defense against the larval parasitoids that are present in North America. So they will attack spotted wing. They'll put their egg into spotted wing larva, um, but the egg is melanized. And you can see that in the upper left graph and the lower left graph, those dark spots in the spotted wing are melanized eggs. So this is like a host defense. It encapsulates the egg and doesn't allow it to develop. So we get no parasitism. Next. So that leads to going to the origin of spotted wing, Asia, and looking for parasitoids that co-evolved with spotted wing that have overcome this host defense. So we've spent 213 to 2017, mostly in China and South Korea, with a large group of, of folks helping us, looking for resident natural enemies, resident to the native area that might help us control spotted wing drosophila. Next. We found 19 species reared from drosophila species in both South Korea and China. Um, of these, there were three species outlined here in red that gave us greater than 5% parasitism. One Briconid, Asobar japonica, and two Fagidids, Gnaspus brasiliensis and Leptopolina japonica. Next. And here's a photo of those three insects. They don't have common names. We just go with Gnaspus, Leptopolina, and Asobara. We did learn from our collections in China and South Korea a little bit about their biology. We know that they attack the spotted wing early in the season and they get outcompeted later in the season as the fruit is a little bit riper, a little bit more rotted. That's when you get more of the larval parasitoids that we find commonly in North America as well. Next. One of the other things I wanna point out from our collections in China and South Korea and the top graph we see the composition of these three parasitoids. In red, that's Gnaspis. In blue, that's Leptopolina. You can see that Gnaspis and Leptopolina are the most common ones we're finding. You also see that at different collection sites, we find both of them together. That is good. That means they work in concert with each other. In the lower graph, we see the parasitism rate on four different host plant species two rubus, a fragraria, and a sambucus. What I wanna point out is that together, usually they were getting about 20% parasitism. We got as high as 70% parasitism at some sites. So my hope is we're not going to get complete control, but I'm hoping we get about 20% parasitism in North America. That might be enough 
to lower the population in some of these outlying areas to lower the pressure of spotted wing going into the crop field, making insecticides more effective. Next. So how do we get these things from China and South Korea into the US? We have to do quarantine studies. We looked at a number of their biological parameters, temperature development, host stage preferences, and the like, interspecific competitions, but the real key is looking at their non-target impacts. Next. We see here Asobara, Leptoplina, and Gnaspis, and this is a group of different Drosophila and other related fly species that we expose them to. We see Asobara was reared from most of these. These are offsprings per female. So Asobara is a generalist. It will never be permitted to be released in North America. Leptopolina did attack quite a number of species, but we can see it focused on this Drosophila mel melanogaster group, which includes Suzuki eye. And Gnaspis, and this is the G3 strain, really focused on Suzuki eye and closely related species. Next. So what's the process then to get this out? Well, the petition has to go through the USDA. It triggers a federal action, and that leads to two acts, uh, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Both of these address risk. Next. So in quarantine, we had to look at seven different aspects of these parasitoids, biology and impact, and what would happen once we release these. But the most important is highlighted in red, and that's that non-target impact. Next. So we've submitted this petition to NAPO. Typically, this takes two, or two to four years. It's cleared NAPO. Next. And currently, it is out for tribal consultation. And then we'll get into the public registration for public comment. Next. And that's when we ask you to make comments that this is important, spot and wings, a uh, nasty pest, and that you do want these parasitoids to be released. The last steps, APHIS makes a decision. It goes through a FONSI Act. This process goes very quickly. So we hope to have permitting this spring and expect releases to start this late summer or August. Um, and hopefully, uh, we get colonies built up and out to everybody. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna continue on the topic of non-chemical control tactics and turn it over to Ash Sayal, who's going to discuss cultural and post-harvest control strategies. Thanks, Anna. Next, please. All right, so, you know, the main goal of cultural and post-harvest control is to purposefully manipulate the environment in which pests live in order to reduce pest population and crop damage. Next, please. You know, when we go out in the field and look at, for example, a blueberry bush, what we notice is that the temperature within the center of the blueberry canopy, bush canopy is lower as compared to the lower or upper portions of the canopy. At the same time, the relative humidity is higher in the middle of the canopy as compared to the lower and or uh, upper portions of the canopy. Now, when we look at SWD uh, OV position in the field, that is based on our studies higher in the middle of the canopy as compared to lower or upper portions of the canopy. What these studies show that the temperature and relative humidity are the two most important factors that do, uh, affect SWD survival and development in the field. For example, 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit is the uh, optimum range for SWD. As soon as temperatures start to rise above that, uh, uh, supplies either don't survive or their reproduction gets affected. Similarly, relative humidity, they like to live in higher relative humidity, 70% or higher is, is, is better, but at lower relative humidity, they do not well. So now the question is, what can we do to manipulate these two factors 
to make the environment less favorable in the field. Next, please. And there are a number of things that we can do in the field to manipulate those two uh, uh, environmental factors to make the field less uh, optimum or environment in the field less favorable for SWD. Netting, uh, irrigation. Uh, we can manage uh, you know, mulching in terms of weed mats or pruning, harvest frequency, or using refrigeration of the fruit after harvest to actually manipulate these environmental conditions for SWD to make them uh, less favorable and reduce survivorship and development of SWD. Next, please. Now, in the next few slides, I will show you a very brief overview of the work that was done under OREI project. For more detailed information on all of these aspects, please go, we'll, uh, you can watch a, a webinar, the recording of which is available on YouTube. I will show you a link at the end of my slides. So let's start with the physical exclusion. There are several studies were done in multiple states and those studies show that if done right, mesh netting with, uh, using less than one millimeter mesh uh, can exclude flies from the field. They can reduce uh, fruit infestation and improve mar marketable yield and also fruit quality in raspberries and blackberries. And specifically in blueberries, this uh, exclusion technique can provide up to 100% control. However, because of the cost involved, it may not be feasible for uh, large size farms, for example. And in general, costs run higher at the beginning. Some farmers have been very creative in repurposing their existing resources at the farm and using materials that they had at the farms to actually lower the cost to, to start these, to, to establish these tunnels at the farm. Next, please. So irrigation is another factor that we can uh, become manipulate to actually affect SWD uh, populations in the field. For example, there are two main uh, types of irrigation. One is uh, drip irrigation and other is over, overhead sprinkler irrigation system. And we compared both the systems, the relative humidity was lower in the field when drip irrigation was used. As, as I pointed out earlier, as SWD is very sensitive to low humidity. So which uh, what this uh, comparison of the two irrigation systems did is showed that the SWD fly emergence was lower in the field where drip irrigation system was used as compared to the fields where overhead sprinkler irrigation system was used. Next please. Mulching is, is another factor. For example, uh, here, when we look at biology of the flies, when larvae feed, larvae feed obviously within the fruit, when they're fully developed, they drop out of the fruit onto the ground and actually pupate inside the soil. When we use this mulches on the uh, ground floor, actually what it does is it, it prevents the larvae to get inside the uh, soil to pupate and overall surface temperature on those mulches is relatively higher. It results in majority of the larvae being killed due to heat. And also as a result, they cannot complete the development and fruit infestation reduces. This has, they have, there are many types of mulches that are available. Black weed mat is most common one, which was very effective. And another reflective uh, mulch was uh, that was tested in Michigan, for example, this Mylar, that also uh, showed uh, significant results uh, against SWD. Here is a publication, if you are looking into or interested in more details, please take a look at this publication from our group that uh, has details of studies done in multiple states. Next, please. Pruning is another important factor for SWD. What it does is basically heavy pruning opens up the canopy lets more light come pass through the canopy, which reduces, uh, slightly reduces relative humidity and increases temperature, which creates less uh, favorable environment within the canopy where most of the fruit is. As a result, overall fruit infestation decreases. Studies in multiple uh, states uh, have shown 
uh, that this may be an effective uh, way to actually lower population of SWD flies in some situations. In addition to uh, impact on uh, direct impact on SWD, what it does is actually improves spray coverage as well as harvest efficiency, uh, which also is good for overall uh, production at the farm. Again, the details of these uh, results were published in this uh, publication shown here. If you are interested, please, uh, in, in details, please take a look at this publication uh, and get more information there. Next, please. Harvest frequency. You know, harvesting is very important, especially when we're dealing with pests like SWD, which is attracted to the ripe fruit, as Hannah showed in an earlier slide. When we leave more ripe fruit, it serves as a resource and, attract, and attracts flies more toward the field. When we remove this resource, it makes the, the environment within the field relatively less attractive. As a result, overall infestation reduces. As studies show uh, that uh, uh, harvesting every two days was more economical in terms of uh, uh, marketable yield and also uh, the uh, overall uh, fruit infestation in, in terms of cost of actually per unit fruit harvest. Next, please. Another most important factor is, which is almost uh, which is uh, present in almost every field, is the cull fruit or leftover fruit in the field, which obviously is really overripe and very attractive to the flies and serves as a breeding ground for those flies. If we can, uh, several studies show, if we can remove and destroy those cull fruit, uh, there are different ways to do that. And uh, for example, you can put them in the sealed plastic bags and leave them in the sun up to two to three days, that will take care of that. Or you can bury them at, at least two feet in deep into the soil. That will also take care of that and will prevent further fly emergence from those fruit. This is extremely important. This will reduce attraction of the flies toward the field and overall lower infestation rates in those fields. Next, please. You know, last but not least, if you are, have harvested a fruit and you suspect that there may be some uh, fruit infestation there, you can still do something. And that is refrigerating fruit at lower temperatures between 32 to 36 Fahrenheit. If you do that, that will do a couple of things. Number one, it will kill most of the larvae inside the fruit. And number two, it will slower, uh, slow the development of the fruit, which will allow you more time to bring this fruit from field to the, to the table, to the marketing channels. So if there's a way to maintain lower temperature uh, throughout the uh, supply chain, that will significantly help lower fly, uh, the larval development inside the fruit and bringing uh, clean fruit to the table. So to summarize, you know, there's a number of cultural practice that all may be applicable in, in a, a, every situation, but a good combination of these strategies is, a, a, is an excellent way to supplement your other uh, chemical control to overall decrease population of this uh, fly in the field. This was just a quick overview of what uh, we have done under OREI project on these cultural controls. For detailed information, here's a, a link to our uh, webinar on organic management of spotted wing Drosophila, which is available on YouTube at this link. You can access that and get that detailed information on all these aspects. Thank you. All right, next we'll be moving on to an update on monitoring research and potential applications of that information for behavioral control with Cesar Rodriguez. So Cesar? Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so our priority in SWD monitoring has been to identify a lure or bait that was effective, selective, that provides early warning, and that correlates with a fruit infestation. In a multi-state, multi-crop effort to achieve these goals, we tested various lures that combine a fermentation lure used as our standard lure with volatiles from yeast and leaves. However, we found that combining volatiles from different sources made the standard fermentation lure less attractive to SWD. Next. 
We also monitored SWD attraction to these lures during and after the fruiting season and found that the yeast and leaf lures are more effective when leaves and fruit are absent, indicating that background odors may affect SWD response to these lures. And next. To date, uh, the lures based on fermentation odors remain the standard for monitoring SWD and are commercially available in the US. Although these lures are effective and provide early warning in some states, they are not selective and not always correlate with fruit infestation. And next. To make traps easier to use, we have tested the efficacy of red panels to capture SWD instead of using the standard liquid traps. In a study in Michigan in cherries, red panel traps were better at capturing SWD than the liquid traps. In New Jersey blueberries, red traps and liquid, trap, liquid traps uh, capture the first SWD before fruit infestation, thus providing similar early warning. However, studies conducted in various states found variable results. And next. A MARC release recapture study was done to determine the range of attraction of these red panels. This study found that the maximum dispersive distance for SWD is 90 meters, which translates to the need of one panel trap every seven acres. Next. Because there is no trap lure uh, and lure that fits all geographical regions, the stakeholders express the need to move towards implementing behavior-based control methods. We have tested a splat attract and kill formulation from ISCA Technologies that combines attractants with insecticides in a waxy, waxy dollop that releases um, the attractants slowly. This formulation shows promise in reducing SLED infestation. Next. In addition, we are testing a food grade gum matrix that reduces SWD oviposition in fruits by competing with fruit for oviposition sites. These two formulations, the splat and the food grade gum, are going through the process of registration. Next. Uh, moving forward, we plan to continue to compare the efficacy of these behavior-based strategies in multiple crops and states. We also plan to combine them with repellents to develop uh, novel push-pull systems. And we also plan to determine the economic feasibility of these strategies to increase their adoption. Thank you. All right, and our final topic puts all of these pieces together in order to make efficient decisions. So I'll turn it over to Miguel to tackle that topic. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so we, our team focuses on understanding the economics of uh, SWD and how to better control. As part of this, our team has evaluated different control strategies, in particular con comparing calendar-based spray, which is the status quo, uh, what most grow growers use, versus different IPM strategies, including early harvest, including monitoring to guide insecticide applications, and including post-harvest cooling. So one thing that we have learned in the past five years is that the economic assessment is very specific to the region and to the crop and to because and to the particular uh, problem with SWD. So what we have been focusing on is also to developing Excel-based interactive management support tools to develop specifically for regions and crops to support decisions on how to best control. Next, please. So I will share with you some examples of, uh, of studies that we have done. Uh, the papers associated with these studies are available in our website. And for example, in New York, we focus on high bush blueberry farms, focusing mostly on UP operations and, and, and sell direct to consumers. And in this case, we compare 
calendar, calendar based sprays strategies to monitoring based IPM strategies. The main finding here is that in order for monitoring based IPM strategies to work better, it's very important to increase the efficiency of trapping of, of taps. Uh, because current trapping efficiency uh, is, is works in favor of, uh, it's, it's so low that it works in favor of uh, farmers applying the uh, insecticide uh, through the cropping season. So our results here is that, is that one way to, to improve, uh, to improve, to make monitoring more economical is to improve efficiency. We find, however, that some of the some of the monitor monitor based strategies have slightly lower total costs than calendar based spray strategy in the case of blueberries in New York. However, important is to consider that when we consider the environmental costs of insecticide application in terms of water pollution. Uh, effects on birds populations and even effects on resistance of the of SWD to insecticide application, we find that most monitoring based IPM strategies uh, exhibit lower total costs when we take into account these costs. This beg the questions of if of uh, the need for incentivizing farmers to and growers to to use IPM strategies. Next, please. So another example is we focus also on high bush blueberries in North Carolina. And in this case, we focus in the comparison between, between, between not having and having post-harvest cooling. And one of the benefits of having post-harvest cooling is that you can avoid insecticide application and solve the problem of infestation of presence of larva in, in, in the fruit after you harvest. Um, these models are, are complex because problem is as you, as you keep fruit on a storage, especially when you sell to the fresh market, the price uh, the price of the of the fruit declines over time. So basically our results indicate that it may be a good option for growers in particularly in North Carolina and perhaps in other areas to consider, consider post-harvest cooling as a strategy to control for SWD. We find, for example, in this case that the break-even year of investing in a cooling facility is in year four. After year four, you recover your investment and it becomes profitable to, to, to have cooling. Uh, we also find uh, that once you have the cooling equipment, uh, if you use post-harvest cooling as a strategy to control, then the average profit increases by over $100 per acre, about about $50 per, uh, over $100 per hectare, which is about $50 per acre. Next, please. Uh, another example uh, is in low, low bush blueberries in Maine. And here we focus on comparing control strategies during weeks that are close to harvest. And in particular, we are, we are evaluating whether, whether it is worth to spray one more time or to harvest early. And our results are very interesting, even for those growers that that are not that are not organic, that are that are that use insecticides. It may be uh, it, it, using harvesting early, leaving a small portion of the fruit and harvested may be economically uh, beneficial in comparison to collect uh, to harvest 100% of the fruit. Um, and apply insecticide every week. For those that those growers that are constrained because they cannot apply insecticides, we find a range of uh, early harvest that ranges between harvesting when 
65% of the fruit is ripe to almost 99, depending on the impact of the impact of SWD on yields, the price, and, and other considerations. Next one, please. And this is the last one. Uh, so, so given that the problem of controlling SWD is very specific to crops and regions, our strategy has been to, to develop interactive management support tools. They are Excel-based, easily down, downloadable by users. Um, and uh, I am showing you, for example, the, the one that we developed for low bush blueberry production for Maine. The yellow screen basically tells you, tells the grower, give me the characteristics of your farm. Of your, of your production facility and the price that you will get. And we have, a, we have a few crop budgets and then the purple or blue screen in, on the right shows you what will be the return to either early harvest or apply insecticide in a given week under different scenarios. Okay, next. So, so that concludes. Uh, so just, uh, I just want to mention that in the future, we are uh, focusing on developing more Excel-based interactive management support tools for different regions, as we learn more for, from the scientists about the impact of, of SWD. And in particular, we are focusing this year on, 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 on the following comparison. We are, we are focusing on comparing monitoring methods, trapping versus fruit sampling, which is becoming increasingly popular. We are going to examine the economics of biological control. When is it profitable under which conditions? And in, for some uh, growing regions, we are also going to assess the economic benefits of netting. And that concludes. Thank you for your attention. All right, so that concludes our webinar for today. Just a few take home messages for each of the sections. Um, I'm not gonna belabor the point by reading through these, but these are useful um, synopses of all of the different topics that we covered. I wanna highlight some additional online resources. So there are websites that have been produced by members of our project team, as well as our project website, swdmanagement.org, where the recording of this webinar will be available by the end of this week. We also have um, social media tools for our project that you're welcome to engage with us on, as well as some state specific resources that are highlighted. We're going to spend some time now answering the questions that came across in the chat box as well as in the Q&A. For those of you who can't join us or who have to run off to another meeting, feel free to email your questions to me at this email address and I will make sure the right member of our project teams gets directed those. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that you can see our panelists and I can direct some of your questions to them. All right, so now you can see all of our panelists and I'm going to go through some of the questions that have been posted in the chat box and address them to our group. First, there was a question from Peggy about the effect of exclusion netting on tunnel temperature. Um, she's concerned that tunnel temperature might be increased by netting and that that might be a negative impact on production. Any thoughts on that? Ash, do you wanna take that question? Yes, that studies have shown in Minnesota and uh, Arkansas that temperature does increase inside the tunnels, which uh, is, is a concern in some cases, but it can be at least to some extent managed by, with the choice of uh, the fabric that is used for netting, mesh size and maybe other material. Rufus, do you have uh, something additional? Yeah. And my experience has only been in Michigan, but I know for the north here, we we didn't see really high temperatures in netted tunnels. Um, so I think it's probably for the south areas and there are people that have got a lot of experience with this in the commercial side who could give growers guidance if they are looking for advice on that. Here in the west, we have uh, lots of tunnels. Um, they do it for very high quality production and, and high value fruit. Usually those tunnels are um, 
are uh, can be opened for ventilation on the sides and fronts as well. Now that negates the whole issue of excluding insects, but ventilation plays a really, really important role. We've seen even in scenarios where tunnels are um, open on the sides and fronts, that there is a benefit for, um, for spotted wing grossophila because you're reducing water. If you've got a summer rainfall area where you can get water on fruit, you're excluding water by having the, the plastics um, as, a, as a protection. Yeah, and just to echo that, that excluding the water preserves whatever pesticide application you might have been made might have been made for longer. It also um, maintains firmer fruit. So fruit tend to be a bit firmer coming out of tunnels. And it allows you to pick when it's raining, which means you can keep up with your harvest schedule and keep to that two day interval um, that results in lower infestation. Um, I wanted to highlight two comments that were made in the chat box briefly and then move on to another question. The first was from Frank Hale asking for extension publications from our team. I'd like to give the panelists as well as any of the attendees from our project team a chance to drop links to any extension publications that you would like to in the chat box for our attendees. And then Clayton Myers, who's with uh, US EPA, posted a comment related to FOSMET or the active ingredient in imidan, which is currently under registration review with EPA and pointing out that EPA will be seeking comments relative to that registration review and presented some links in the chat box as well. And as we have highlighted, that's an important tool in our toolbox in many of our cropping systems for spotted wing drosophila. Um, so the next question I wanted to tackle is from our Q&A. And that um, deals with the food grade gum attractant. Um, and this is uh, thing, something I think you'll be able to tackle, Vaughn, which is what is the main attractant in that food grade gum approach? Um, there's actually been quite a bit of work done, not just in our lab on that, on that but um, the, the seven comp there are seven compounds, maybe even more than that. Um, and these are fatty acids. There is increasing um, evidence coming from labs in Europe and also here in the United States that fatty acids play an extremely important role in changing the behavior of these insects. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, compounds like methyl meristate um, and so on, se several other fatty acids that, that typically haven't really been studied that much. And those fatty acids are produced by the insects themselves. Um, they, they can volatilize and, and dissipate very, very quickly from the berries. So <laughs> there is a, a, a short period of attractancy, but if you formulate it in the right way, it can be attractive for linger, longer periods of time. And, and that's what's being used in that food grade gum at this stage. And Cesar, um, there was also a question about the attractant in the splat product, the SWD hook. Um, can you comment on the attractants there? Um, I can comment, but I cannot say much about it. Um, that's, um, that's a product that it's uh, owned by ISCA Technologies. Um, I know the compounds because we're going through the registration, but I cannot share the information with uh, the public at this point. Um, uh, yes, um, it's, it's good news that we're going through the whole process of trying to register uh, the, the uh, this plat at this point and also um, we're trying with uh, Vaughn is uh, starting also the process of registering the food grade gum. And that registration process can take time um, and uh, you know when you look at what Kent um, has been struggling it's, it's taken years to have the, the parasit the permits to release the parasitoids and we're kind of in the same place hopefully not not quite as lengthy but it does take time to get that registration through. All right, so we had a few questions related to mulch as a cultural control. Um, a couple of questions dealing with the application of wood chips. Um, did that improve spotted wing control or was it just neutral or, or not beneficial, Ash? Oh, you're muted, sorry. The wood chip did not make significant difference among the mulches that we tested. Uh, those uh, bead mats actually were the most significant ones uh, and also 
uh, mylar. All right, so there's a question about insecticide rotations from Dean Polk. Um, Dean asks, uh, what are your thoughts as a group about insecticides making weak insecticide applications first or the best insecticide applications first? And Vaughn, I think you are probably in the best position to tackle that one. Uh, we've done this work both through modeling and models allow us to do various hypotheses and what the models were showing us at, at very little cost is that you should go for the compounds that that not only um, kills the adult life stage, but also the immature life stage. And, and I don't know if um, that, that is something that we don't always think about. Um, and so there is a paper that was recently published by um, Suran Murmur. And um, this whole team is, is on that paper as well. What we showed is that you want to select pesticides that also kill the, the immature life stages, the eggs, the, the larvae that's inside the fruit. I, I, you know, if you look at the, the slides that Phil was showing, many of those compounds that are highly effective fall within that category. But uh, focusing on spraying the compounds that are killing every single life stage earlier as opposed to later, you know, saving the best for last in this case doesn't really work that well. Um, if, you can, if you can spray it early, you're knocking out those populations much better. And, um, and you get longer um, legs on it if you're using those compounds. More days for protection. So other comments from the group about pesticide rotation before we leave that topic? I think Vaughn covered it really well. I would go in with your best ones earlier. And I'll just add the additional benefit of that is if some of those um, broader spectrum, higher toxicity materials have a longer PHI, if you apply them earlier in your rotation program, you can get them out ahead of the harvest period and perhaps use something that might not have been acceptable during the harvest um, due to a longer PHI. So that also puts a few more things in our toolbox that we might have removed otherwise. Um, there's a question in the chat box that I'll go ahead and tackle, which is what is the status of the male spotted, the male sterile spotted wing drosophila? Um, some of you may have filled out a survey early in the year related to those questions. Um, the status of some of these genetic control tactics are that at least one strategy is now undergoing um, greenhouse and field type trials. Um, that's from a private company based in California. And that work is being conducted outside of our project. So I'm not familiar with the research results, um, but that is an additional step forward. Um, I will just emphasize that for some of these genetic control tactics, there isn't a very clear um, regulatory pathway yet. And so for each new organism that's being studied, it will have to forge a somewhat unique path through the regulatory environment. So I think that it's probably going to be a longer process than what we are used to for things like pesticides or other control tactics or even for our biological control agents that are moving through this known regulatory pathway. Um, but there are some, there is some progress with respect to field research for some of the, the genetic control tactics that have been developed. Um, next question is dealing with mass trapping. Um, so, any thoughts on mass trapping spotted wing drosophila to prevent entry at the beginning of the growing season or for control during the peak of spotted wing drosophila? And I will just throw that out to the group because I think most, many of us have had some level of research related to this. So feel free to jump in and answer whoever would like to start. Well, I'll start. I'll just tell you my own experience here in an area with um, very high populations of spotted wing drosophila. We tried some mass trapping approaches in the Traps caught a huge number of spotted wing drosophila flies, but we could not detect any change in infestation. So just from our region in Michigan, in a similar setting. In New York uh, and uh, Connecticut, a study trying to track and kill to, as enough to reduce pressure. In fact, <laughs> that study we found a little higher 
infestation near our traps, even though we caught a lot of flies, it kind of bled over into the fruit. Uh, we tried it also in New Jersey early on, uh, before we started trying uh, the track and kill approaches. And we found the same thing that Greg mentioned, that um, the traps are not very efficient at retaining and capturing the, the flies. So you get uh, infest, higher infestation near where the traps are located. So, right. um, so it, that's why I, I believe it's better to do an attract and kill approach. And there was another question in the chat related to egg laying behavior. Um, and the question specifically was, will multiple adults lay eggs in a single fruit or is there some kind of signal to avoid competition? Um, that's again, work that a number of us have been involved in, um, but we've done work in our lab trying to tease that out. And on the small scale, on the individual fly scale, in the very short term, they will avoid a substrate that has been attacked by another fly. However, that's a really short-term effect. Um, so when we run these laboratory experiments, we see that behavioral response um, two hours or less. But if we go longer than that, we tend to see that behavioral response go away. So over time in the field, if you have a high rate of infestation, there's probably eggs from multiple flies present in that fruit. And as we, as all of us have seen collectively, when we've gone out to untreated research locations, we can find extremely high rates of infestation with, in some cases, 40 or more flies per single fruit. And that is almost certainly the result of multiple infestation events from multiple individual flies. So we do have another a number of other questions present in the Q&A in the chat box, um, but a lot of them are addressing um, some of the same topics or things that um, I think will be most effectively addressed on a one on one basis. Um, so I'm going to ask one final question um, and then we can uh, conclude our Q&A portion of our webinar and um, I will get back to the rest of you who had questions on an individual basis. Um, so the final question I wanted to tackle is one that comes up periodically as well. So I think it's a good one for our group to address, which is how effective is erythritol against spotted wing drosophila? Is there any recommended rate? And is that a legal material? Um, so I know a number of you guys have also done some work with that. So feel free to hop in. And if no one claims that I'll, I'll ask somebody specifically. Um, so there has been efficacy shown um, here in the United States as well as in Belgium, maybe five or six years ago. Um, whether it's practical uh, is, is, is open for debate as well. The concentrations I know are really high. Um, I don't know if it's legal or not. I suspect not, I don't know. Yeah, I think as a, a use as an insecticide, it would probably not be a labeled recommend a labeled material. So the one thing that we've shown in, in some of that work and, and Jaina Lee um, and Manyon Choi has done a lot of that kind of work right uh, recently is that you do need to add sugar as well um, to improve its efficacy. And so it's a combination of the erythritol with sugar and there's been a bit debate about the use of sugar um, as, a, as, a, as a pesticide as well, whether that's legal or not. So th those are questions that need to be answered by your state or your local law enforcement agency, I guess, I don't know. All right, so thank you again for joining us and um, for hanging out for our question and answer portion. This concludes our webinar for today. As I mentioned um, previously, the recording will be available on our website by the end of this week. And feel free to reach out if you have additional questions to myself or any of the members of our project team. Thank you all.